Brought to you by Reuters Plus Content Studios. Sponsored by Mazda. Hello and welcome to Future Energy Talks with me, Andrew Wilson. The commercial aviation sector is highly visible when it comes to climate concerns. It's frequently criticised for the emissions it produces, with some justification. But can a course be plotted towards a sustainable future for the industry? And what are the technologies being developed to scale sustainable aviation for commercial use? Aviation is one of the fastest growing sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Combating this is a pressing issue and all 260 members of the International Aviation Transport Association, IATA, the sector's most widely representative trade body, have committed to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. But how are they proposing we get there? Our love of travel is only increasing post-COVID, so we'll need to harness revolutionary technologies, new business practices, and significant public-private collaborations if we're to have any hope of reducing aviation's carbon emissions. My guest this week is Val Miftakov, the founder and CEO of Zero Avia, who brings first-hand experience in developing leading-edge technologies in the renewable space. An avid helicopter and aeroplane pilot, Val has now turned his attention to pushing the boundaries of what zero emissions aviation powertrains can do. He's the former leader of eMotorVax, an EV battery and grid services provider, and now sits at the forefront of the changes in the industry. Val, very warm welcome to you. Great to be here. Thank you very much. As I mentioned in the introduction, you're now looking at transforming the aviation industry as it grapples with ways to mitigate its carbon footprint. But why is it taking so long? It's a very hard sector to decarbonize. Or, um, and it's not just about carbon, right? So everybody talks about decarbonization. It's really about removing all the climate effects. And it's not just about carbon. Um, so there's consensus now uh, on the, um, in the academia circle, circles and um, probably half of the industry that um, two thirds of uh, aviation climate impact is actually coming from non-carbon sources. Um, that's from combustion of fuel at high altitudes. So you really need to get away from all that. And that adds uh, additional complexity. So it's not enough to just burn better fuel, um, like sustainable aviation fuel, for example. You actually need to get away from combustion overall. Uh, and that means um, basically you need to electrify uh, aircraft. Um, unfortunately, batteries are not uh, power dense enough uh, to do that for any size commercial aircraft over any kind of distance. So you really need to bring in the brand new fuel. And we think that hydrogen and specifically hydrogen electric approach, which means um, you store hydrogen board the aircraft, uh, then you convert that to electricity, utilizing fuel cells, um, and then electric motors drive the uh, uh, propulsors on the aircraft, that's the best approach to do it. But that requires a lot of R&D, new technology development, uh, and that's what Zero Ave is doing. Well, given the current focus on sustainability, what's the outlook for commercial aviation and its target of net zero by 2050? Oh, that's a that's a good, good question, because um, it's one thing to have the technology available, which we think by 2050, actually by 2040 or so, uh, we will have technology by Zero Ave and some other players, um, true zero emission technology, not just um, you know, sustainable aviation fuels um, or different uh, synthetic fuels, but uh, true zero emission technology available for all sides of aircraft by 2040. But then there is a matter of market adoption and how soon will the fleets convert? Um, and that requires concerted action by the governments, um, by the policy bodies, and uh, by the operators. Um, and you can see this uh, playing right now in the EV space, electric vehicle space on the ground, for example. Uh, the technology is there, uh, the adoption cycle is in some places slow, in some places uh, pretty fast. You have Norway, for example, that is already over 90% uh, all new vehicles that are being bought are electric vehicles. So we need a set of policies at that point um, that allows us to accelerate that transition. So the short answer is, yes, we can. Technology will be there. 
but this will require a lot of action from the policy and uh, the operators. Well, you mentioned market adoption, and we know we've already seen that's uneven in the EV space. I mean, what do you think will be the barriers to adopting hydrogen electric flights? I think the, um, the fundamental uh, force behind the um, adoption of this technology is going to be economics. And we have shown already that uh, we are able, through hydrogen electric approach, we're able to drive better economics uh, for the vehicles than even the jet fuel, um, not even talking about the sustainable aviation fuel or synthetic fuel. And the reasons for that are much higher efficiency of um, both fuel production and also the fuel utilization. Um, the, the hydrogen fuel cells are much more efficient than um, hydrogen turbines or um, any um, internal combustion engine. So as a result, we're able to do at launch, um, say 2025 uh, for a small aircraft, 2027 for uh, a large propeller aircraft and then regional jets, we're able to uh, deliver better economics on a per seat mile basis than even jet fuel. Um, better fuel economics, better maintenance economics, because uh, again, it's non-combustion, so um, the material stresses are significantly lower, lower temperature, lower pressure. Um, and that's what will drive the adoption. Um, so it's really a good story there on the economic side because any scaled adoption requires economic advantage. Will it be cheaper? It will be cheaper. And um, still though, you know, even if things are cheaper, um, that makes things faster to adopt. Um, but we're talking about massive, massive fleets. Now, so today, um, there are some estimates out there uh, on the uh, total value of fleets uh, in the market um, at over a trillion dollars uh, across all the aircraft types. Um, so even if it's cheaper, uh, there is still you know, inertia of the market of the, just the sheer number of uh, number of aircraft. Um, so there will be there will have to be at least um, the fleet um, adoption incentives of uh, some sort to enable people maybe it's on the uh, let's say um, a um, loan basis uh, to get some financing for adopting the new technology um, in the end this will be profitable for everybody who provides money into that uh, but the money will have to be come up from somewhere let's face it manufacturing new technology for the aviation industry is always going to be difficult what are the hurdles and the manufacturing for these engines will be, um, I think, somewhere in between in terms of the technologies used and um, uh, the challenges in manufacturing, somewhere between the traditional aerospace and the uh, automotive manufacturing. Um, so, of course, automotive uh, uh, players have um, had some experience with fuel cells uh, and with electric propulsion uh, already. So there is a lot of learning uh, from that point. And uh, we are, of course, building on the... Uh, on that experience um, with the aviation grade uh, versions of that technology. So we're bringing some of those um, uh, manufacturing technologies in. At the same time, um, the certification environment, the regulatory environment is uh, quite a bit more robust uh, in the aviation space. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, factors uh, from that point. Well, Val, we know that hydrogen power is not the only option for low carbon flying. There are also sustainable aviation fuels. How practical are they for achieving or helping to achieve net zero? So for sustainable aviation fuels, we think it's a great uh, transition fuel uh, for the next several decades because we don't have zero emission, true zero emission engines for all sides of aircraft. And um, even when we start, um, uh, putting in the market uh, our engines that start with the uh, smaller aircraft and go to larger aircraft. Um, we will not have uh, engines, zero emission engines, covering uh, wide body aircraft uh, for a couple of decades, maybe 15, 20 years. Uh, all that time, if we want to get to uh, net zero by 2050, we actually need to have uh, a way to transition that larger aircraft to uh, at least zero carbon, right? If not zero climate impact. And the only vector for that it is going to be sustainable aviation fuel. The only part of the sustainable aviation fuel um, ecosystem that actually scales is going to be synthetic fuels. So hydrogen bound to carbon produce synthetic hydrocarbons. Um, and that's the required transition fuel that we're going to have. 
but it is akin to um, the hybrids in the uh, electric vehicle space. Um, so my previous company was in the EV space, uh, ground transportation, and we of course saw this from, uh, from within, from the inside. You had a five to seven year period on that market when a lot of the um, new vehicles that were put on the market were hybrids as the batteries were not good enough yet. Uh, they were not applicable for long journeys. But if you look at uh, the automotive market now, virtually nobody creates new hybrids and it's all about battery electric because batteries became good enough and batteries are just better technology for ground vehicles that do not have that much um, energy intensity compared to aircraft. We think the same transition will happen in the aircraft space. So maybe just a little bit longer because um, the vehicles last um, three times as long in the uh, aviation space, uh, so 30 years versus 10 years. So you're gonna have maybe a couple of decades of transition period while the new zero emission engines are being developed and deployed. And the only way to uh, get these larger aircraft in that time onto the uh, zero emission journey is through uh, um, sustainable aviation fuel. So I think it's a great opportunity for the interim uh, for let's say um, two, three, four decades. Uh, but then we're gonna see a uh, transition to the uh, true zero emission propulsion. And Val, we haven't talked about retrofitting the current aviation fleet. How much of a challenge will that be? The benefit of hydrogen electric approach is, is that it's much, much less intensive on both the energy requirements and capital expense requirements on the infrastructure side. So when people talk about sustainable aviation fuels, um, they, they like to uh, point to the fact that it's a drop-in replacement for the aircraft and engines, which is true largely, but it is anything but on the infrastructure side. Actually, if you look at the investment that's required to bring in uh, sustainable aviation fuel at the volumes that are required for wholesale transition of aviation, the investment in both in dollars and in energy, in primary renewable energy, is two to three times higher than what would be required for hydrogen electric. And that's because of the less efficient fuel production and less efficient engines uh, once you take the fuel onto the aircraft. So we think actually hydrogen electric is the lowest possible investment scenario at the whole system level. You've already talked about the huge shift required to make hydrogen electric planes a viable prospect for the industry. What kind of partnerships do you need to make this work? This is a great question. And uh, we at Zero Ave were very fortunate uh, and continue to be very fortunate to um, establish a great ecosystem support around our solution. Um, we have seven aircraft manufacturer partnerships, uh, which are very important uh, to deliver this technology to market. Uh, we have uh, four out of top 10 worldwide airlines uh, as our customers and investors. Uh, we have uh, now close to 15 airports uh, around the world partnering with us um, on bringing this technology, the operations of uh, hydrogen powered aircraft uh, to their locations. Uh, so we've been able to uh, really show um, the operators, the airports, and the aircraft manufacturers that this is uh, really the path forward. And we see a lot of the um, uh, adoption from these players. Um, this was very uh, good for the company, of course, but also uh, more importantly for the industry as uh, we look to uh, bet on the right technologies uh, to support this transition. Look, we haven't really talked about safety yet. I mean, is hydrogen fuel a safe prospect? Uh, the Hindenburg does come to mind. Yeah, the safety is a, a very important question, of course. And uh, in, the, uh, in the beginning, I remember uh, back in 2018, 2019, you know, first years of uh, running the company, uh, we had uh, Hindenburg uh, come up uh, so many times that I had my second slide in my company presentations uh, would have the Hindenburg picture in it. Uh, the hydrogen disaster, of course, of uh, 1930s. And the main message there was um, the technology has moved on in 80 years since. Hydrogen is actually a huge commodity now worldwide. Um, we as uh, humanity, we uh, rely on it quite a bit already. Uh, 100 million tons a year are being produced. Uh, 
mostly used in petroleum uh, sector and uh, fertilizer production. And by the way, 100 million tons is the volume that would be sufficient to move the entirety of aviation uh, to new fuel, right? Replace 100 billion gallons of jet fuel today with 100 million tons of, uh, of hydrogen. So it's not a inconceivable um, infrastructure problem to uh, uh, generate that much. But uh, by now, we have um, studies from uh, various um, academic institutions and government bodies, including NASA, uh, several studies that uh, basically say that hydrogen can be even safer aviation fuel than jet fuel. Uh, there are multiple physical and chemical parameters of hydrogen that are actually significantly better uh, safety-wise uh, than jet fuel. For example, if you have a leak uh, from your fuel tanks, um, the fuel hydrogen does not pull uh, below the vehicle, does not ignite from the uh, uh, hot brakes, for example, on aborted landing um, and things like that, right? So, uh, um, and automotive industry, I think, have shown through operation of now over 100,000 vehicles on the ground, uh, whether it's uh, material handling equipment or uh, passenger cars, that hydrogen can be very, very safe in the mobility applications. So looking ahead then, what are some of the bright spots we can expect to see in the future and when? Absolutely. So um, we're going to have our first uh, launch of the um, uh, in-service of the uh, 10 to 20 seat aircraft in 2025. Um, that's the first commercial service. We, of course, have flown a number of prototypes already. We're flying our largest prototype, full-size engine, full-size vehicle today uh, in the UK, um, working on the 80 seat prototype already. Um, so 2025, we'll have the first um, uh, generation of engines uh, in service. Um, and uh, from 2026, uh, we're scaling that up. From 2027, 28, it's a larger propeller plane, 29, 30, it's regional jets. Um, and uh, we are going to develop a series of engines for progressively larger airframes, single aisle Boeing 737, Airbus A320 size in um, uh, early 30s, um, and so forth. So we think this technology will be applicable for all sizes of aircraft, and that's how we're going to transition aviation to the new future with complete abatement of the climate effects, um, lower noise, no ground pollution, which are all also significant um, sources of uh, distress uh, from uh, uh, aviation. Right? It's not just about climate effects, it's also about ground pollution effects. Um, noise or otherwise. And uh, we're going to solve uh, all of those things. The technology is getting there um, and uh, the future looks bright for a uh, future of aviation. Val Miftakov, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Good to be here. Great point about reducing noise pollution as well as climate pollution. It's certainly a technology which looks like having an exciting future. Join me next time for more Future Energy Talks. Please subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. I'm Andrew Wilson, and I'll see you next time. Brought to you by Reuters Plus Content Studios. Sponsored by Mazda.